In this video, we're going to present some expressions for the linear elastic strain energy functions. If I have a linear elastic material with an area E0 and a length L0, and if a force is applied, the area decreases to A and the length increases to L, and if this is a linear material, which means the relationship between the force and the extension is the straight line, then the energy stored is equal to half F multiplied by delta, delta is equal to L minus L0, and the energy per unit or original volume is equal to half F delta divided by the original volume, which is E0 L0, which is equal to half F divided by E0, multiplied by L minus L0 divided by L0, which is basically half sigma on 1 multiplied by epsilon 1 1. Extending this to all the other components of stresses and strain, the strain energy stored in a linear elastic material per unit volume is equal to half each component of the stress multiplied by the corresponding component of the strain, which means the strain energy per unit volume is equal to half sigma 1 1 epsilon 1 1, sigma 2 2 epsilon 2 2, sigma 3 3 epsilon 3 3, sigma 1 2 epsilon 1 2, plus sigma 2 1 epsilon 2 1, sigma 1 3 epsilon 1 3, plus sigma 3 1 epsilon 3 1, and so on. Because of the symmetry of the stress and the strain matrices, we can combine sigma 1 2 epsilon 1 2 plus sigma 2 1 epsilon 2 1 into one term, sigma 1 2 multiplied by 2 epsilon 1 2, and 2 epsilon 1 2 is the sh uh, engineering shear strain gamma 1 2. Similarly for sigma 1 3 gamma 1 3, and sigma 2 3 gamma 2 3. For linear elastic isotropic materials, if we replace the stresses with the strains, or the strains with the stresses in this equation, we get one of the two equations, either the strain energy as function of only the stresses, or the strain energy as function of the strains. For linear elastic isotropic materials, we want to show that the strain energy can be decomposed into two components one due to change of volume and one due to change of shape. So let's start with the general equation for uh, linear elastic isotropic materials. The strain energy is equal to half each component of the stress multiplied by the corresponding component of the strain. Then we're going to replace the stress with the deviatoric stress component plus pi. So we know the shear stresses stay the same, but the normal stresses S1, uh, sigma on 1 is equal to S11 plus the hydrostatic stress P. We can further manipulate that equation and put the term with P on its own and the other term with the deviatoric stress components on their own. The term with the deviatoric stress component is going to be called the strain energy or the deviatoric part of the strain energy. The term with the hydrostatic stress component is going to be called the volumetric strain energy. By further manipulating these equations, and substituting with the relationship between the stress and the strain, we can reach that the deviatoric strain energy is actually equal to the von Mises stress divided by 6g, while the volumetric strain energy component is equal to 3 multiplied by 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio divided by 2e multiplied by the hydrostatic stress squared. So the significance of these two equations are the following. The energy or the part of the energy that is responsible for the change of shape is function of the sigma von Mises squared. The part of the energy that is responsible for the change of the volume is a function of the hydrostatic stress squared. We're now going to look at the strain energy stored in beams. First, we will look at the linear elastic strain energy stored in bars under axial loading with small deformations. Just to remind you, in bars, we only have one stress component that's not equal to zero, which is sigma on one, and only one non-zero component for the strain, which is epsilon on one, which happens to be equal to du one by dx one. And so the strain energy for a linear elastic material is equal to half sigma on one, epsilon on one. So we're going to calculate this and integrate it over the whole length, over the whole area, to find the total energy in the beam. So the total strain energy stored in the beam will be equal to the integration over the area and the integration over the length, each component of the stress multiplied by the corresponding component of the strain, 
The only non-zero components are sigma on one and epsilon on one, so half sigma on one, epsilon on one. If we replace sigma on one by E A epsilon on one, we get this equation, which basically tells me that the total strain energy is equal to E A over two multiplied by D U one by D X one squared, all integrated over the D X because the integration of the area gave me the constant area. Next, we want to calculate the strain energy in an Euler Bernoulli beam with small deformations. Again, to remind you, in an Euler Bernoulli beam, we ignored all the strains except epsilon on one, and we found that epsilon on one is equal to this value. Sigma on one was equal to this value, negative m x2 over i, and there was also some shear stresses. The strain energy will be equal to half multiplied by sigma on one multiplied by epsilon on one. They are the only non-zero because all the other string components are zero. So the only component left in the energy is sigma on one, epsilon on one. Substituting from what sigma on one is and epsilon on one is, we get this equation which tells me that the total energy in a beam can be calculated using one of the three equations, either this one, that one, or the third one. And the first one is half the integral from zero to L, M multiplied by the second derivative of Y with respect to X one squared integrated over the length. Or if I replace M with EI, the second derivative of Y with respect to X one squared, I reach the equation that I can calculate the total strain energy by saying one over two EI, the integral of M squared DX one. And so in the lecture, we're going to go through some examples to calculate the strain energy in beams with different boundary conditions to see what the effect of the boundary conditions is on the total energy stored inside a beam.